All right, what's going on guys? Today we're gonna to be doing a bench test of the Motenergy 1507 motor with the Kelly KLS 9661-8080 IPS controller. I have everything wired up already, but I'm gonna be going through all of the wiring. I'm gonna go through the configuration procedure to identify the hall angle, and as well as because this is a sine cosine based encoder, we need to do an additional step to determine the zero point and amplitude values for the sine cosine encoder before we can do the hall angle identification test. So I'll be going through all of those things in detail, but first uh, let me just go through the major components. So here of course we have the ME1507 motor, I have a bench mount that I created, and here I have the contactor attached to the bench mount. That is connected via the phase wires to the Kelly controller. Then powering this whole thing, I have a 24S 100 volt battery pack. It's 100 volts fully charged. That's uh, a lithium polymer battery pack in a 3D printed case that I have um, a video of. So if you want, go and check out that video. I have it on my channel. Then, Doing all of the switching and basically controlling all the electronics is this 12 volt setup. So this system controls all of the 12 volt accessories and all the switches to turn on the controller, as well as, you know, just like a basic wiring arrangement for the 12 volt system. The way I have this set up is I have a 12 volt lithium ion battery. This is just like a, a power supply that you might use to charge your phone or something like that, but it puts out 12 volts. And this is used to drive the control circuit on a solid state relay. Now the solid state relay has the high voltage on the main circuit. So when the relay is closed, the high voltage line from the battery runs to this DC-DC converter. And that converts about 100 volts down to 12 volts. Then the power from the DC-DC converter comes back to this junction box, the 12 volt junction box. First of all, it goes through this diode to charge the 12 volt battery. So it's a lot like a regular system in a car. You know, you have your lead acid battery used to start the car. And then once it's running, the alternator charges the battery. So this is the exact same setup. I have the DC-DC converter. And once it's activated, it charges the battery. But in addition to charging the battery, the 12 volt DC-DC converter uh, also powers this relay. So this relay is a 12 volt relay that will engage the pre-charge resistor. So as soon as you turn the key and, 12 on, uh, and turn on the 12 volt system, the pre-charge resistor will connect across the contacts of the contactor and will bleed off some of the charge that's in the capacitors of the controller. In addition, it also powers this fuse box. And this is where I would connect all of my accessories. So like lights, everything that runs on 12 volts. Right now, the accessories I have connected here is the contactor. So I need 12 volts to open and close the contactor itself. So once this has 12 volts, I can just flip the switch and that will close my contactor. In addition, I have the power source for the controller itself. So this is not on a switch. As soon as I turn the key to provide power to the 12 volt system, so the electronics in the controller will, will activate. I have a common ground here. This is coming from the high voltage source and that is connected to this ground junction box and all of my grounds are connected there. So the ground from the battery, the ground from the 12 volt DC-DC converter, as well as the ground from the high volt source, they're all connected to the same point. Additionally, I have this ground also connected to the ground of the controller itself. So let's look at the controller next. All right, so here we have the KLS 96601-8080 IPS controller. Just in terms of the connections, you have your positive here. This is actually the positive terminal, input terminal for the controller, and it's connected through a fuse to the positive terminal of the battery. So this goes directly through the contactor to the positive terminal of the battery. 
Then on the negative side, you have your B minus cable. This goes to the common ground that I described earlier. For the phase wires, these are labeled as U, V, and W. And if you're using the ME1507 motor, uh, the phase wires have three different lengths. You have a long wire, a middle wire, and a short wire. And the long wire is U, the middle wire is V, and the short wire is W. Then you have the wiring harness for the electronics. So this has three connectors and they have, you know, a number of features that you would connect to each of the plugs. So here you have the three plugs coming off the wiring harness on the controller. So the main thing on this pin is your power source. You have your ground on the top pin and then your 12 volt line on this bottom pin, uh, which is labeled as pink. It's got a pink wire. Then uh, the other large connector has your throttle. You have your ground on this pin over here. Then this pin, which is a purple wire, is um, a five volt output. So this is actually giving you five volts. The controller is converting the power that it's getting from here to five volts, and that's used to power your throttle. And then the green wire on this pin is your throttle signal. So if you have a voltage-based throttle, you know, you would give it from zero to five volts. And uh, if you're using a potentiometer-based throttle, it can also take the resistance reading. And then finally, this pin has all of your hull and motor-based electronics. So if you were using a standard uh, three line hull sensor, you would connect those here. But because this motor has a sine, cosine, encoder, we're putting sine on this pin, hull A. Cosine is the middle pin, and that's it. And then this final pin is not used, so that just is left empty. Then across the top, you have your ground. Rattle, which I think they mean orange, is gonna be your temperature sensor input, and then the five volt input to actually run the encoders to give power to the encoder, whereas opposed to here, it's five volts, but you're getting five volts from the controller here. You're expected to give the controller five volts to run the sine cosine encoder. So that goes on that pin over there. Now let's look at this connector on the motor side. So on the motor side of things, uh, the ME1507 motor uses this sort of connector. This is called a Metripack connector. And it's actually pretty high quality. A lot of people cut this connector off and solder together a wiring harness to attach to a connector like this, the type that the controller uses. But I actually like this connector a lot. I didn't want to chop it off. So I got at the male end of this connector. I just ordered it. Again, it's called the Metropack connector, so you can find those online. And I just made a wiring harness or like an adapter harness for that connector to the controller. In terms of the wires, so you have a couple of wires here. They're mostly self-explanatory. The black is gonna be ground. The red is gonna be your five volt source. So you're expected to provide five volts to the motor for to run the encoder. Then you have this thick green wire, they, the motor specs label this as shield. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how the shield, because this is basically ground. So I'm not sure how that differs from this ground, but in terms of the setup with the Kelly controller, this doesn't go anywhere. So this is not connected to anything. Then you have these blue and white pins, and these correspond to sine and cosine. And I actually forgot which one is sine and which one is cosine, so I'll just update that in the video. And then you have these two yellow lines. So on the specs for the motor, these are both labeled temp, temp minus and temp plus. But on the controller, you have only one place for the temperature sensor, so I wasn't sure how to connect those at first. And what I found out was that temp minus is basically the, the ground for the temperature sensor. So this one 
the one with the black line goes to ground, which means that this pin and the black ground pin go to the same line on the controller. So I have them spliced together. So they both go to the same place. And then this one off to the side, the yellow one, that goes to quote rattle, you know, the one that's labeled rattle in the Kelly controller manual. So that goes to the temperature sensor. Then you have the communication cable for the controller. So that's on the uh, connector here. That is for programming the controller. So you connect that via USB to a computer and the controller came with harness like this, but you know, I don't have a Dell from 2003 anymore. So I would have needed an adapter to, to use this cable. So, which was kind of annoying, but fortunately Kelly controllers also sells a direct to USB cable. By this USB cable, you can connect it directly. Keep in mind, you also have to install a driver to run it. So they also have the driver on their website. So you just download the driver and then you can use that adapter wire. Then finally, I just want to go quickly show the wiring for the contact. Basically the way it works is just like a relay if you provide 12 volts. So these are connected across. If you, you know, this is your ground, this is your 12 volt source. If you give it 12 volts, the contactor will close. But the other thing is that this also needs a diode here. So you know, just take note of the orientation of the diode. It's gonna prevent current from running across this way. So current will be able to run this way only, from negative to positive. All right, so we have the battery connected. And now what we're gonna do is use the key to activate the 12 volt circuit. So that gave power to the solid state relay, as well as the 12 volt appliances and the relay for the pre-charge resistor. So the pre-charge resistor should now be connected. There should be power to the controller, even though there are no lights or anything, or I don't believe any indicator that it's actually on, but I'm gonna assume that it is. And what we can do next is use this switch here to close the contactor. All right, so now we can hear that the contactor closed and this entire system should now be on. Next, we're gonna connect the USB cable to the laptop and we're gonna try to run this monitor application. So, but before we do that, we actually have to run the configuration app and set the number of poles in the motor, which is 10. So, Tenergy 1507 motor has 10 poles and we need to set that in the configuration app. Just plug this in here. And let's go ahead and open the configuration app. This is just a warning saying, don't do configuration with the motor running, I guess. Yes, the motor is not running. No power and I've, you know, I've had a bunch of issues with this. Sometimes it helps simply to unplug the USB cable, plug it back in and try again. There you go. So in case you have that problem, just uh, unplug the cable and plug it back in. I wish it would be a little bit more robust and you don't have to do that, but nevertheless, at least it works. But we're gonna go to the motor tab. And I actually set this up before. The motor poles are right here. So you would set the number of poles in the, mo in the motor, not the number of pole pairs. Uh, if your motor is giving you some spec for the pole pairs, just multiply that by two, and that's how many poles you have. Then the sensor type for this motor is in fact four. The resolver poles is two. All of that is correct. So the values that we need to determine here are the hull line zero and the hull line amplitude values. These are just some default values in the program. So we need to determine those values for this motor specifically. So in order to do that, we're gonna quit this program and we're gonna go to the Kelly controller monitor application, which you can download from the website as well. Data read error, data read error, retry never works. The only thing that's ever worked for me is just oh, unplugging 
the USB cable and plugging it back in. So let's do that again. And let's go ahead and try that. Uh, data reader, data reader, data read error. There we go. So like I said, not the most robust system here, but you know, with little trial and error, it does work. So uh, the only thing this application does is read the sine and cosine values. So that's labeled as HBAD and HAAD. One of those represents the sine side of the encoder and the other one represents the cosine side of the encoder. I don't know which is which. But the idea is that when you turn the motor shaft, those sine and cosine values would be different, right? As the motor is turning because the encoder is sensing the position of the shaft. And I'm just gonna keep turning this shaft. So as I turn it, you can see that those numbers are changing. So what you need to do here is note the maximum and minimum values of the sine and cosine signals. So they should be the same, right? Because they should have the same amplitude, uh, but because one is sine and the other is cosine, they should have some phase shift between them. Here in the manual, so, uh, you know, you have a sine wave and a cosine wave, you know, just imagine these two are on top of each other and they have a phase difference of 90 degrees. So the zero point value is the point where they cross right there. And then the amplitude is, you know, the distance from here to here. So that's the amplitude. And then that's the zero point value, the voltage value basically there. Although you won't be entering it as voltages. And then the amplitude is that value there. So that's what you need to get. And because you're getting, you know, I don't know what these values actually refer to, you know, exactly in terms of units. So the maximum value uh, is 205 for each one, if you watch carefully. All right. And then the minimum value is about 106. So those are our max and min values for our sine, cosine encoder, 205 and 106. Okay, so here I just printed out the basic instructions for uh, determining the zero point and amplitude values and the Hall angle identification procedure. So this is all outlined in the Kelly controller manual, but there it's pretty verbose with broken English and they go into theory about the voltages and things like that. I didn't find that super helpful. Um, so I just boiled it down to the basic steps. So the main idea is that like you have a sine wave and a cosine wave, right? And pretend this is, let's say this is the zero point value. So you want to determine the value where the sine and the cosine wave crosses. This is your zero point value. And then you want to determine your amplitude. Right, so that's this value here. So, and what we have, we just determined the max and the min values. So if you, for, for the uh, zero point, it's basically the difference between the two, or, or it's the midpoint between these two, right? That would be the zero point value where it crosses. So that's just a midpoint formula, right? It's min plus max over Two, right? So that's the uh, zero point value. And then the amplitude, because you have the zero point value, right? You have the, or you have the range, you just do the max minus the midpoint, or let's say the, the zero point. And that's gonna give you the amplitude. So these are the sort of basic intuitive equation equations. However, the values that you actually, the max and min values that we determined from the monitoring software, uh, like I said, I don't know what the units of those values are. I'm not really sure. So basically what it comes down to, it's this is also in the Kelly controller manual, is that you use this formula to determine your zero point and amplitude values. So 
these two intuitive formulas are, you know, in the brackets here. And then all you need to do is multiply these values by 1023 and then divide by 255. So if anyone maybe knows what this refers to or, you know, what's the math behind, you know, this, uh, the, these scaling factors, you know, definitely let me know in the comments. But basically, you know, you got 1023 times uh, max plus min, what do we say it was? Uh, 106 plus 205 divided by two. And then all of that divided by 255. And then the amplitude would be 1023 um, times 205 <clears throat> minus this value here, 106 plus 205 over two. And then all of that divided by 255. Um, this one, I believe, comes out to 624. And then this one is 199. And I just round it up also. There's some decimals, but uh, you want to round them up to whole values. All right, so now we're back on the laptop. The controller is on with the contactor closed, even though I'm not entirely sure the contactor is important at this point. But we're going to plug the USB back in. And we're going to go to the configuration app. All right first try. So we'll go back to the motor tab and we're going to enter our the hull line zero and amplitude values that we just determined. So this one was 624 and then this one was 199 and we're going to click right. Written to success. That's good. So let's read it once again, just to see that those values are saved. And indeed they are. So next we're gonna do the hull angle identification procedure. So here we have the procedure for the hull angle identification. So what we wanna do, there's a field, we, we're supposed to enter 170 in the angle identification field. I guess that's a code. And then we're gonna click right then we're gonna quit the configuration program and turn off the power supply. Then we're gonna turn the power supply back on and the motor shaft should start spinning randomly. Uh, we're gonna wait two to three minutes and, until the motor stops. Then we're gonna turn off the power supply and basically power cycle, then open configuration program and the hull angle value should read 85 indicating that the identification operation was successful. So, um, let's, what's vehicle? So identification angle. So right here, it's 85 currently. Let's see what this message reads. If read data is 85, the normal operation of the said. So 85 is normal operation. In 170 and then restart the controller, will automatically into a state of identification of angle sensor. After the success of identification will be automa automatically reset to 85, the state of normal operation. Range is 85, 170. So it seems like you have two values here. You have 85 and you have 170. So let's give this a shot. I'm going to set this to 170. And then I'm gonna click, go to click, right. Written to success. So then we're gonna, let's actually look at that again. All right, we have 170, we're gonna quit the application. We're gonna unplug our USB cable. We're gonna turn off our contactor and we're gonna turn off the controller. So now, once we turn everything back on, I'm hoping this motor shaft is gonna start turning. So we're gonna turn the controller back on. Oh, there we go. 
and we'll turn the contactor back on so that way we have full power. Uh, it's doing something. I hear some buzzing coming from the motor as well. This is because it's trying to identify the angle and probably certain um, configurations of the angle are not allowing the motor to turn, which is causing that buzzing. It seems to have stopped, but it hasn't been two to three minutes. So I'm gonna let it sit for two to three minutes in case it does anything else. All right, nothing so far. I'm gonna say that this is complete and I'm gonna Turn off the contactor and then turn off the controller. So now I'm going to turn everything back on, start up the configuration software and I guess we should see 85 and then the motor will be ready to run, hopefully. All right, so let's turn the controller on. Let's turn the contactor on and let's plug in the USB cable. All right. And look at that identification angle 85. So now I think we should be ready to turn the motor. Let's give that a shot. Let's first of all quit this. Let's unplug this. Because I don't think the controller is going to turn the motor if the app is plugged in. So let's restart everything anyway. Turn the contactor off. Turn the controller off. Let's turn the controller back on. Let's turn the contactor back on. And moment of truth. Here, I have to go real slow. Oh, I hear something come out of the motor. You hear that? Whoa! Sick! Awesome, it's working. Man, I am so glad I really didn't, <laughs> I didn't think that was gonna work out or at least be straightforward. There we go. Pull this off, huh? Nice. Pretty stoked this is working out. It's pretty smooth. Um, I don't have it connected to the table, but I don't really feel too many vibrations on the table at all. By the way, this 12.2 volts on the throttle, uh, I think it's reading the voltage from the battery itself um i don't know what's up because i have that connected to the switch i don't know what's up with the wiring there i'll figure that out or use a different throttle or something but obviously um this 12.2 volts is not the voltage running the motor that's coming from the um battery at about 94 volts currently so let's actually take a look and see how much current we're drawing 
from this unloaded test. And so we'll just use this, uh, this clamp meter to monitor the current. We got one amp. So obviously not a lot of current because we don't have any load on the motor shaft, but there we go. We've, uh, I didn't actually take it up to full throttle, uh, maybe three quarters of the way um, at four amps. This is just fun. All right, well, there you go. We have a successful bench test of the ME1507 motor and uh, Kelly KLS 9660180 IPS controller. I hope this was helpful for everyone and I hope it will allow you to set this kind of thing up yourself a little bit more easily. So if you have any questions, please leave them down in the comments. Uh, please like this video if you enjoyed it and uh, definitely subscribe if you like the kind of content I'm putting out. So now that we have the motor spinning, I actually wanted to address one other thing. So here we have the motor spinning, but it's in the clockwise direction. And because I would have this motor mounted on the motorcycle pretty much in this orientation. So, you know, you would have the motor here, you'd have the chain coming back this way, and you'd have the wheel back here. We would actually want it to be spinning counterclockwise for forward. And so right now it's basically turning backwards. So in order to do that, we have to go into the configuration software and configure this motor to, to be running in the opposite direction. In order to do that, what we'll do is plug this back in. I don't know if I have to power cycle it or if it's gonna work right away, but let's see. All right, nice. In order to change the motor direction, um, we need to simply check this change direction box and hit right. Written to success. Let's hit read one more time just to see that value coming back and we have change direction. So now we're gonna quit the program. We will unplug the USB cable. And I don't know if it's gonna work right away or if we need to power cycle the controller. I'm just gonna power cycle the controller. All right, we'll leave that off for a few seconds and then we'll turn everything back on. And now, hopefully, this will turn in the opposite direction. Nice. There you go.